Good morning. It's nice to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good, glad to see all of you. If you're having a hard time finding a seat, we'll usher you. Find a seat for you. Would you join me in a responsive reading, please? By God's great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through Christ's resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, Lord, we are all witnesses. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, underfed, and unfading. It's Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. By God's power, we are guarded through faith for Christ's salvation to be revealed in the last time. It's Jesus raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Let us pray, please. Source of our refuge and strength. As we enter your sanctuary, you guide the way our footsteps should go. You protect us from paths that often imperil us. You shield us from situations we should not pursue. As we pause to ponder your bountiful goodness, may your comfort and presence precede us this day. Hear our words of praise and thanksgiving as we respond to your counsel and care. Amen. Will the children please come forward for children's moment?
we come to a time of prayer, I know you've got several people that you want to remember in prayer, and I'm going to mention them as unspoken prayer requests here in a little while, and you can raise your hand a signal that you have an unspoken prayer request that you want to remember. Lots of friends, lots going on, lots of disease out there, lots of trouble. All we can ask is that God helps us. Lots of mistakes that are being made by people, and all we can ask is that God helps us and that God will help us to find his meaning and goodness in the future that he has for us, and he will. Would you like to mention any prayer requests today? Anybody that you'd like to mention out loud? Pray, and at the close of our prayer, you join me in the Lord's Prayer, which is uh, printed in your bulletin. Lord, we love you so very much, and the time that we spend together on Sundays is so valuable to us and encouraging us, strengthening us, but a part of that encouraging is mentioning a prayer request. Because, Lord Jesus, though we come into these walls, the few of us that are here today, there are many who are away today, Lord, for a variety of reasons. We ask that you bless them wherever they are, but you also that you bless the rest of the world. Because for every person that's here today, Lord, there's at least 30 that are out there that are lives are influenced by that one person in a drastic and influential way so help us as we pray for them for these spoken prayer requests as well as the unspoken prayer requests we give them to you and ask humbly your help lord as we deal with a difficult world and deal with the difficulties that each of us have and all of us have them and ask humbly today lord that you bless us and help us in finding solution finding answers and finding a way of coping with those difficulties that we are facing we love you so very much, and we thank you for the goodness that you do for us, giving us our church, giving us our leaders, and giving us the opportunity of service that we have. Now, even as you've taught us to pray, we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing. Am I going to lead us today? I don't mind. Is our singing leader out today? I guess she is, isn't she? All right. Our first hymn is in your bulletin, and it is hymn of preparation. Fill my cup. Hymn number 351. Of course, the words will be up here. Thank you, Christy, putting the words up for us. It is a precious song. I hadn't sang that in a while, and it is good to sing it again. It brings a lot of memories to me, though, as we sing it. It was a good friend of mine. He and I decided we were going to try to sing a, a duet one time in a music contest over at, first, over at the Sherwood Baptist Church. And uh, he lived over just down here on Clinton Street, not very far from this church and I lived over on 55th Street. He and I decided we'd practice on that and we were going to meet and play tennis right across the street at Sherwood Park, play tennis, and then we were going to go and practice our song. Well, it wasn't long. The pianist, though, we met with, she was a much greater musician than we were and she suggested that we not sing. In a, in so he and I both agreed, but he was my best friend throughout life. And then thank you for letting me remember him today with that. Beautiful, beautiful song. <laughs>
It's so good to be with you again today. And I want to continue in just a brief message that I'm going to share with you in talking about the condition of the church, something that we share especially at Lenten season. And we are still in the middle of the Lenten season. And I want us to celebrate that which is the church and also that we are, which are the disciplines of the Christian faith to remind us how we grow. The disciplines of the Christian faith are designated in the scriptures and today a part of that is the number one reading of the scriptures that's one of the five elements of discipleship is that the bible becomes a precious gift to us something precious something that we want to read i'm going to read several passages today the first is taken out of the gospel of matthew chapter 5 beginning with verse 19 Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. To anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge. And the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I'll tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, go gorge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. If it has been said that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. One of the seven secrets, and again, they are not secrets as such, of unity with God and others is the secret of the Bible and leadership in its truths. For example, these truths. These are truths, and those truths, though, symbolize greater truth, which is the heart. We can take the law, as this Bible verse explains to us, and beat each other with the law. Beat each other over the head with it. You did wrong. You did evil. But instead, he's trying to teach us that there is a deeper law, that which is in the heart, that which has forgiveness as its great source of meaning and goodness. You and I are forgiven, the Bible says. We are people of the book because the Bible is our guide, but the Bible can be misinterpreted. The Bible can be taken and you can beat somebody over the head with it so much that they no longer have respect for the Bible really is an odd thing to meet someone who has learned on their own to have Bible study, studying the Bible on their own, and they discover the truths and find out that many of the things that were supposed or assumed by people at the Bible about the Bible really aren't true. For example, I have seen people in the church and heard about it, not actually seen it take place, but a good friend who was actually confronted in the church about a sin in their life, had them stand, and then they cast them out of the congregation. What a terrible thing to do. Forgiveness from the Lord is offered to all of us for everything that's done, and no one can judge another. That's why we are people of the book. It is our guide for the kingdom. 
The Holy Spirit interprets the words, the written word to us, and makes that word live inside of us. That's why we need interpreters for it. It was a long time ago when I became a Christian, and then very shortly after that, really only a few years after that, I felt the call to become a minister. Many people would have assumed that you cannot feel that call, that that was not true. The guidance of God in our lives is the most significant and important thing that happens to us, our own personal walk with God. I made a commitment to him, and that commitment was definite, and I'll share that for another sermon one day, the story of it. But that commitment was for me to be the best minister I could possibly become. And so I decided that I would earn a certain level of education in seminary and that I would make sure that I had studied the Bible in its entirety and making sure that all of those courses that I had taken through that level of study and that that story of study, that history of study was to prepare me to be that minister. Since that time, you and I both have seen people who call themselves ministers or people who call themselves ministers called of the Lord and find out that really they had called themselves as ministered or as I met in seminary that their aunt or their mother or their grandmother called them to ministry I met them in seminary we'd sit down and we'd talk about their call to ministry and say tell me about your call and they'd say well my grandmama said that I was born to be a minister and so I'm going to do it I said you know what there needs to be a little more than that There needs to be something beyond that. There needs to be the call of God upon your life. You see, the call of God is not just to preachers. The call of God is to all of us, to the vocations and to the work that we do. Your work is a holy work. What you do in this life, even as a retired person, is a holy work unto God. He's called you to be there. Y'all, I've been a hospice chaplain too long. For someone to say to me, I am too old to work or I'm too old to be used of God, what a ridiculous thing to say. I've been a hospice chaplain too long. I've seen too many people die before they were old enough to be able to put on the years that they wanted. Goodness gracious, y'all, even this week, several of my patients died. And those people, many of them were middle-aged. Some of them were into their, what people would consider older years. Why are you still alive? Have you thought about that? There's a reason for you to be alive. Just as there is a reason for this church, this building, to stand on this corner. It was put here for a reason. Out of the prayers and the blood and the sweat of many people, not preachers, the people who make up this congregation, you, who are the true ministers of this church, you believe in its purpose. You believe that it's here for a reason, and that's why you're devoted to it and should be, need to be. You and I need instruction in the meantime. In these long years that he gives us that we're living and we wonder, why am I still living? God has instruction still to give you. Don't you, as I do, every time you read a new passage of the Bible or every time you go to Sunday school, you say, I didn't know that. You learn something new in your faith. That's the whole reason you're still alive. You're still learning. Trouble will not stop. The difficulties and the trouble of this life will continue. Those difficulties do teach us and through them we learn. We learn things that we never imagined that we could have learned before that. Instruction. And that instruction is also included in the biblical instruction that we that we learn. The written word helps us to... Avoid eternity amnesia, if you would. You and I have a tendency when we have trouble to get an eternity amnesia. Have you ever met a person that has amnesia? It was a good friend of mine. He was the uh, treasurer, the financier for the city of Amarillo. And he just happened to go to the church that I was pastoring. Very intelligent guy. Had a very responsible job. He was responsible for all the finances of the city of Amarillo, Texas. He lived just around the corner from where I lived in the parsonage. In that particular area, the houses that had been built were built very quickly, as they are in many other areas. But what they do when they build quickly is that the junk that they had left over, they dump it somewhere, where usually where it shouldn't be, and just cover it over with dirt. 
Well, there was this large mound outside of where the limits of the city were that had this dirt over the top of it, a big mound, and the kids played on it. They'd ride their bicycles up and down it. Well, what it was is where all the junk was, all the junk that they had had after building all those houses. They dumped it out there and just covered it over with dirt. Well, eventually that stuff started coming out. Eventually, pieces of metal started being sticking out outside of the dirt, and we'd have to warn the children about going over there and riding their bicycles up and down. Well, this particular guy, who is the financier for the city of Amarillo, he decided he would play with the kids one day, and he was out there playing on the bicycle, and he went down one side. The bicycle was too little for him, so he didn't have his feet on the pedals. He had them just stuck out wide, going down that hill, and he tumbled head over heels. Well, I heard the ambulance because I was just a block away and I knew that it was somebody in my community. And so I went to see who it was and lo and behold, they had come to get him. His mother was there, his wife was there and several other people. What had happened was is he had had a concussion and he had temporary amnesia. He was sitting in the ambulance and when I got there, he wouldn't let his mother or his wife touch him because he didn't know who they were but for some reason he knew who I was and so when I arrived he said Jimmy and he grabbed my hand and pulled me into the ambulance with him and I said I'll stay with you and I'll ride with you this is going to be all right you're going to get your head your uh, your um, memory back eventually well and he did Long story short, he did get it back. But on the ambulance ride, he kept repeating over and over again the same phrases because his, he had forgotten it all. My name is, and he would say it. My boss's name is, and he would say that. His boss's name is such and such. And then he'd realize what his job was and he would throw his head into his hands. My life is ruined. He said that over and over again at least a thousand times. That's all I heard in the ambulance. As we got closer to the hospital, eventually he started adding some new phrases. And in less than three days, his memory had returned. Thank goodness for the city of Amarillo. And his memory returned, having all of the memory of where the finances of the city were. Temporary amnesia, but it was horrifying to him. Horrifying to his family. He finally recognized who his mama was. She didn't like that very much, him knowing who I was and him not knowing who she was. And why that was, I don't know. Why he knew I was, maybe I was a bad memory. I don't know why he knew who I was, or maybe it's just because, as I said to the children, I'm just so ugly that he knew who I was. But anyway, he knew who I was, but no one I didn't know who anybody else was. Memory returns. You and I can do the same thing in any kind of crisis that comes along to us spiritually. Because spiritually we have memories and we have experiences. And as difficult days come on us, we forget. And when we forget, you and I as brothers and sisters to each other are the ones that encourage each other to remember through Bible study, worship and prayer. Our worship weekly does that. When we come together, you and I kind of catch our balance when we're in worship with each other. Because the experiences that we have give us temporary amnesia spiritually. We forget that God promises us he'll never abandon us. But we can't see him. And so we forget that he is with us. We forget that he will help us. We forget to call out to him when we need to call out to him. Instead, we refuse to. Yesterday, a friend of mine were discussing the uh, particular personality of West Texans. I love West Texas, and I am one. But our personality is a breezy self-confidence that can be really irritating. We really think we're something. And we often say so. You remember the year that Permian even printed shirts that had it on the back? We're really something. That's really pretty arrogant for us, but we do. West Texans, I tell them to do something, they'll do the opposite. But I've been a pastor long enough that I've learned to deal with it. I say, all right, come down the front row and go out this side. Y'all come down the sides and go out the middle. Because you're not going to have nobody tell you what to do. 
let alone wear a mask, right? <laughs> you, remember, you remember, I'm not arguing, I'm not accusing anybody, but you remember the same way about it. I ain't going to. Don't you remember the people in the store when we, back when COVID was worse? People were supposed to wear a mask into the store and so they put it on their arm. So that people would go, you can't come in this store without wearing a mask, I'm wearing a mask. Because they're going to do what they want to do. That's just West Texan. Well, God knows that about us. We have to remind each other sometimes because we're strong-willed and we forget. We need to remind each other about the promises of God. I'm going to share with you all before we dismiss here in just a moment one last little story. This last week, one of the patients that I had, and I didn't have them very long, his wife was in the hospital and she was what we call GIP, which meant that she wasn't going to get out of the hospital. She was already comatose by the time that I got her as a patient and got to go up and see her. Lovely couple, live in Alpine, and moved from California out here, haven't been here very long. He was a builder of airplanes. He and his wife both met at a construction. In fact, I think they may have met in Fort Worth at the uh, uh, General Dynamics plant. That's where they met. Married. But lately, things have just gone wrong. Now, they're not like a lot of other people. There are many people around us who are out of money, have nowhere to go, nowhere to sleep. Like the guy who was on our porch. <laughs> Don will tell you about it. Just this last week when Don and I met up here, there was a guy sleeping on the porch up here. He woke up and said, I'll get out. And I said, just go back to sleep. The shade is nice here and it's cool. We don't mind you. You're not hurting nobody. Go on back to sleep. They weren't out of money. He's retired and they have plenty of money. They moved to Alpine but everything has gone wrong. Things went wrong financially with them. They're not out of money, but it went wrong financially in the real estate that they had. They lost their home, and they had to end up moving into a smaller home, and so everything at their house is in boxes. Anybody relate? <laughs> everything at their house is in boxes. And now his wife was dying with cancer. And I went in and sat down with him, a very stoic man, a man's man, you could tell by his face and the way he kept his body was in shape. But his wife was dying and he was at the end of his rope. I stayed there a little longer than I usually stay because he began to cry and to tell me the story and how that his life now was just a disaster. That there was no hope. What was he to do now? Now his wife was dying. And she knew he knew she would die in just a few days, which she did. She lasted another 24 hours or so. But as he and I talked, I did my best to try to relieve that spiritual amnesia that he had of forgetting that God is with you. God has not abandoned you. Yes, things are difficult, but it's not over. If it's over, it would be you that was dying too. God has something yet for you, and I don't know what it is. I can't tell the future. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do know that God loves you and that God is with you and that God will help you with the future yet ahead. Now, where he is today, I bet he's back in Alpine, probably doing his best to catch his balance and find out, what do I do now? Where do I go from here? We all find ourselves there now and then promise is, is that as long as you're drawing breath, God has still great promise for you. You are the salt of the earth. You and I need good biblical preaching. We need good biblical teaching. We need good interpreters. We need studies. We need to keep meeting with each other regularly so that we might remind each other of that. We need the Lord's Supper to remind us that the kingdom is coming. God has not forgotten us. The day will come when we will be with him forever. In the meantime, we're going to sweat. We're going to bleed. We're going to get tired. And sometimes we'll get some spiritual amnesia. And we'll need to remind each other that God is still with us. One last illustration and I do stop. This last week, a good friend of mine, he's a social worker that works with me, but he's also a Church of Christ minister and a good friend. He and I were musing about an old cartoon that used to be in a Sunday morning 
funnies. Did you read them this morning? I read them every Sunday. They were good. A couple of them were really good this morning. It was called Ricochet. Y'all remember Ricochet? Some of you do. It was a Western cartoon. I know a lot of you don't remember it. It was a Western one. And there were a variety of characters in it. It was always funny. But we reminded each other of one particular Sunday morning there was an ricochet cartoon that particularly talked about ministers and I said do you remember that one and he said I, I've got it still he said my sister printed it for me and gave it to me I'll give you a copy and so he gave me a copy and I've got it in my desk at work now in the cartoon it was showing the life of the minister first it shows him preaching at one congregation then it shows him that night studying the scriptures, going through them to make sure that he knew what it said. And then it shows him riding a horse across the desert because he's going to a preaching point. See, it shows him being visiting with a family who's had a brand new baby. So it shows him visiting with a family who's sick and him praying over the sick. Then it shows him running on his horse because the Indians are chasing him as he's going back across the desert from that preaching point to get back to the church. Then it shows him doing some things around the church and cleaning up and painting the church even and then it has old Buckshot who's this gunslinger in town comes to church that morning and as he's leaving church he goes gee preacher I wish I worked one day a week <laughs> it reminds us that we all sweat there is work involved people sometimes giggle at me when they say Jimmy how long did you spend preparing a message or how long did you spend preparing the scriptures hours and hours I keep them that's why I keep them because I spent hours and hours preparing them because I go back and I'll correct when I've learned something new that I missed that first time that I preached that message we sweat that sweating is for all of us you sweat you bleed you get tired because the work that we're doing is important work. When we do get too much, we get amnesia. And we get tired enough to not believe that God is with us anymore. In our grief, sometimes we get too tired. Because grief is hard work. Or we get tired with moving or with a job that we've lost. Or a person that we've lost in our lives. It's so hard. And we get spiritual amnesia and we forget that God promises us as long as you're alive I'm going to be with you otherwise I'll take you to heaven to be perfect forever but as long as you're living here I'm going to be with you because you've got a job to do there's more sweating to do there's more bleeding to do Jody and I are painting the house <laughs> it's a job and we're going to get new car carpet put in uh, this is my repayment because did, we didn't move. We were going to move and we didn't move. So I'm trying to redo this old house that we live in. Crawling around on that floor after I pulled up a piece of carpet, some of those old staples cut my knees. My wife had to remind me, you're bleeding all over the floor. Bleed. I still get cut and still bleed. Still hit my finger with a thumb. I hit my, hit my thumb with a, a hammer. I don't say the same words used to. Now I say, oh, gingerbread cookies or something like that. I don't say the same things I used to say back in the olden days. I still hit my thumb, and it still hurts just as bad. God help us to catch our balance, to lose that spiritual amnesia, and to find our place of service once more in him. Pianist is going to play as we sing together. Hymn number, what hymn number? 337. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. And right offhand, I don't know if I remember this one or not. So you may have to help me. We're just going to sing these verses for you to take a little time in contemplation, a little time in rest. And that's what I want you to do. Often when preachers preach, they make it an, only an invitation. You just put pressure on people. We're not put pressure on you. Rest during these words as we sing them rest if you have a decision to make or have a prayer request you need to share with me come forward and I'll pray with you but otherwise, otherwise just make it a time of rest and let's try to remember what the words are as we go here All right. I'll learn those. 